Hello and welcome to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host, Titus, and today I am joined again by Professor John Marini to continue our series on the great American Western movies. So far, we have covered four of the great John Ford Westerns, The Searchers, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, Stagecoach, and My Darling Clementine. We will do more John Ford Westerns, but now we're turning to Sam Peckinpah, we will do a conversation on The Wild Bunch, his 1969 movie that seems to say the Western is over. The Western has come to a crisis, and that crisis, in fact, we will we'll try to show, is tied up with the crisis of the West, with our own crisis about the understanding of citizenship and government, about human nature and our purpose as human beings. Sam Peckinpah grew up on westerns, went to film school and tried to make westerns. He made westerns for TV and then got into the movies. But by that time, America was going through a kind of crisis that announced the end of the western. His first western, his great movie, Ride the High Country, which we will discuss in a future conversation, came out the same year as Liberty Valance, 1962. By 1969, however, when The Wild Bunch came out, the second great Peckinpah Western, things had changed. And we will see the comparisons between John Ford and Peckinpah, and we'll see what new things become available to the storyteller when he has to confront this new crisis. You could say that the difference between John Ford and Sam Peckinpah is that Ford had the luxury and the genius to deal with foundings. Peckinpah had the curse and his own genius for dealing with collapses. The opening sequence of The Wild Bunch, a shootout between the railroad men and a gang, The Wild Bunch, is conducted while people march through the streets singing the John Ford Western song, We Will Gather at the River. This is Peckinpah's way of signaling that many things have changed and that what that song signified in John Ford movies, which was primarily about hope, is no longer possible now. Things are going to change and they're going to be bad. And this doesn't only show the relationship uh, between Peckinpah and Ford and how Peckinpah was self-conscious as a director of westerns, it prepares us to confront things we had seen in John Ford movies in a new way. At the end of John Ford's The Searchers, the great Ethan Edwards, the most tragic character played by John Wayne, cannot return to civilization. He cannot step into the house. At the end of Liberty Valance, we see that Tom Donifan, the demigod played by John Wayne, comes to a very bad end and is then forgotten. There's no room for him in America. The tragedy of the Western hero was already known to John Ford, but it was handled in a very different way than in Peckinpah. In Peckinpah, it takes center stage. It obviates the city. It suggests that justice in America is in fact going to collapse, that Americans cannot agree on the fundamental political things enough and cannot believe in the things they had believed in before. And so the Wild Bunch starts in the city with a bank robbery that goes bad, and then the city goes away. From then on, America is represented by the railroad men who are shown to be deeply corrupt. This is what we will be examining today. What do you get when you put center stage the tragic hero in a Western? In a sense, this is the end of the Western. But in another sense, new things show up. Questions about integrity, the character of friendship, whether a community of like-minded Western heroes is possible. That's what the Wild Bunch is. What does it mean to be a man of one's word? And what is the relationship between wanting to live free and the pride of organized communities who impose their rules even if their order is quite lawless or unjust in human? Sir, thank you for joining me again. This is another great opportunity for me because I started thinking about Peckinpah as a serious poet, a man whose stories are thought through in a careful and deep way, because I read your essay on John Ford and Sam Peckinpah in Claremont Review of Books. So it's a pleasure to be able to do this in our series on American Masters. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to do it, continue with our conversation over these number of Westerns. Uh, I think The Wild Bunch is a great film in many, many ways, in ways that Peckinpah himself thought would be edifying and turned out not to be. I saw a later interview with him on the BBC about 15 years later 
he thought he said when he did the violence that when he showed that violence, he says, you know, when people get hit with bullets, they bleed, <laughs> things happen. And, and he said, I thought that this would be a form of catharsis. He said, I was wrong because the way people perceive the film, it's hard to know whether catharsis has the same effect when it's understood through a medium that is visual in a play or in words. Catharsis has meaning by the way in which the mind makes sense of it. But when you see the reality of a, a, on the screen, the reality of something that one knows is not real, you have great difficulties understanding what is real and what is not real. And so uh, you're willing to tolerate things that nobody would have wanted to show or would have needed to show before in order to make a point. And subsequently, of course, the films really get much, much more bloody and violent. And when you look at films today uh, and you look at the way th these things are portrayed, the horror and all of that, the people certainly must watch these things, but they seem to be incapable of, of revealing anything other than a kind of revulsion. Now, that certainly is not Sam Peckinpah's intention in The Wild Bunch. I think is the problem that he had in The Wild Bunch and what he was trying to show in The Wild Bunch is the question that he asks already in Ride the High Country. How do you distinguish between right and wrong, between good and bad? And is that understood in terms of the law? Is that understood in terms of kind of morality that precedes the law or something outside of the law? In Ride the High Country, I think it was clear that his hero, Stephen Judd, the Joel McRae character, that he understood the good and the law. He understood it in a way that made it easy for him to distinguish between right and wrong. In fact, in one of the scenes there, he's talking about when he was a young guy and kind of on the wrong path, the sheriff took him out and essentially kicked the bitter hell out of him, I think, as he put it. And Gil, the sidekick, he said that must have taken some doing because he knew that Judd was a tough guy. And, and Judd said, no, not much, he said. You see, he was right and I was wrong. That makes the difference. That's the way Judd put it. Problem, of course, was when Gil asked, who is to say what makes the difference between right and wrong? Judd replies, nobody. That's something you just know. So he lived by the old virtues, but he couldn't give an account of. He couldn't tell why. But still, the law was respected, and there was a certain piety that revealed the authority of the old as something good. But by the end of the decade of the 60s, really, let's put it that way, Peckinpah had lost faith in the law and in the regime in many ways. And he started to look for some kind of virtue outside of the law and even outside of society itself. For in society, he saw only corruption. And of course, when you think about this abstractly, how do you get out of that kind of corruption? Because that corruption was established when the law had become the tool of the powerful and the wealth. Exactly. In a way, it's the same dilemma that Rousseau faces in thinking about where does that good come from, that conscience that he calls it. And in a way, you have to go back a long way. I think the attitude of both Peckinpah and Ford toward progress is one of great ambivalence. Neither one of it embraced them in any real way. They did not embrace progress or the future the way almost all of the progressives did, whether intellectuals or artists or scientists. They always had great reservations about progress because they always understood that you lose something. Peckinpah himself had great reservations. He had such an animus to progress and even an animus to technology that his work was about how to preserve the things that made it possible for human beings to live happily in society. And in his view, the law had not become a way of enforcing or supporting those morals that are necessary for a good society. I mean, you see that in the scene in the movie when the Ernest Borgnine, Dutch Angstrom character, is cursing Deke Thornton, the former member of the gang, who's in pursuit because he's now working for the law as a railroad detective. He's one of the gang that's chasing the Wild Bunch. And the great line that Pike Bishop, that's the William Holden character, the leader of the Wild Bunch, is trying to defend his old friend, Robert Ryan, Deke Thornton. And he says he gave his word. And Dutch says, to a railroad. 
it, it's his word. But then Dutch says, it's not your word that counts, but who you give it to. The question, though, that that raises is, can integrity or honor be maintained if there's no legitimate authority to give your word to? What are offices but oaths, right? For yeah. thousands of years, offices were oaths. You gave your word in upholding something. How do you have an oath that means anything in a society where the law is not even in the hands of the office holders? Uh, yeah. So if the law could no longer be the source of legitimacy, is honor possible in any kind of society? That's the question that Peck and Paw raises. And maybe it was the case that Peck and Paw came to believe that every kind of political society, maybe even civilization itself, had only served to undermine the virtues of the individual. He understood and loved the virtues of those individuals that he admired, including his own father and his grandfather and those great cowboys that he used to go and spend the summers with that he admired so much for their toughness, their integrity, their honesty, etc. I think he said about his own father that he believed in the law as literature and in the Bible. And his father's great hero, as was his grandfather, was Abraham Lincoln. And so there's a lot of similarity between his view of Lincoln and Ford's view of Lincoln, John Ford. Yeah. But when you think about his own father, a lawyer, his grandfather, a lawyer, also a congressman in Washington before the First World War, the law was a big part of his family. They upheld the law and they were upstanding members of the bar associations in Fresno and in California. So the law was a very important thing to Peck and Paw, and his father, of course, was a representation of that. And so he saw that the law could help human beings in maintaining those virtues. But by the end of the 70s, he was doubtful that the law or society had brought about any kind of real progress in human condition, particularly as regards morality. And that, he thought, is what provides the ground of community and happiness. That's what I think he's looking for. So he was led, really, to seek justice or the good society in the state of nature or some kind of pre-political yes. band. So when you get to the wild bunch, they're back to a pre-political understanding of politics. The yes. wild bunch is more like a family or a tribe. A friendship and loyalty are paramount. Yes. In the absence of any kind of regime... Of course, all you have then is dependence upon each other. And you can see that at the point the gang members, when they start to quarrel among themselves, remember Pike intervenes and says, when you side with a man, you stay with him. If you can't do that, you're like some kind of animal. You're finished. We're all finished. Yeah. Loyalty, integrity, honor have to be something meaningful in the lives of all of them. Now, the problem you have with the wild bunch is they're shaped in a society without the law. These virtues that Peckinpah sees as necessary in the wild bunch, where do they come from? I mean, these are men who are living out of their time. They are living in a time when there's a great deal of possibility for corruption, of which they are not immune. And so, in some ways, they're tempted and they're transformed by the transformations of the regime, but they all long for something that was better in the old days. You can see in every time they talk about the old days, it's always better than it is now. Even the very last line uttered by Edmund O'Brien, when he's talking to Robert Ryan about joining the outlaws, he says, it's not what it used to be, but it'll do. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the only possibility of that kind of virtues being used again. They would be going and helping these Mexicans that are seeking some kind of independence. Yeah. And so always when you notice those scenes where they're reminiscing about something in the past, they're always very poignant. In fact, the scene with Dutch and Pike in the tent there after that first robbery where they're talking about the old days to each other, the story is that when Peck and Paul was filming it, it moved him so much that he, was, he had tears in his eyes just watching that. I think to have that kind of appreciation for the old means that you have to have an appreciation of the old as a good. Whatever it is that established that good. In Ford, that good is established, I think, in the things that he thinks are good of Western civilization. Those virtues were still much more alive in Ford's life, certainly in the part of his life that was influential to him. 
and that you see almost all the way up through the end. He's not unrealistic, but he's never pessimistic or nihilist for it yes. because he never doubted that those were good. He just understood, and I think, that the leaders of the West and the intellectuals of the West had come to lose faith in them. Peckinpah, it's more tenuous with him. He admired those good that he saw in the men that he admired, but he didn't quite know whether those were really good, whether that was a, a form of the good, because he was a product in many ways of his time that made it harder for him to see the ground of morality that was established either by religion or by philosophy. And yet both of those were crucially important in his life. I saw an interview once with L.Q. Jones, one of his character actors, and he said, what you have to understand about Peck and Paw is he was a deeply religious man. Not in the sense of, but everything that influenced his mother was very religious. All of those things that shaped how he understood what we could call the sacred yeah. was established in his views that were religious views, but he could never believe those in terms of a rational understanding of religion. So he was always at odds with the feeling for a religion, and yet you can see it in the hymns that he uses, you can see it in so many ways in his movies, but also you have to say that the philosophic or rational tradition was undermined by the time he was a grown man. And so what is the defense of even how does one establish, if one decides to try to reestablish a pre-political band that is going to seek to establish these kinds of virtues in a pre-political way, go back to the state of nature, how do you recreate the ground of that, what is really a kind of romanticism? Yeah. And he tries to recover, I think, what Rousseau had called the sweetness of life, yes. the joy of existence which he thought you could find in natural man before he entered into and was corrupted by civil society. And I think the most telling scene of what he's showing here is the Mexican village. This is Angel's hometown. This is where he grew up. And the members of the gang, before they go into that village, they're shaped by the whole outside world, right? Their dialogue is coarse. They're talking about, well, you have a sister, you have a mother, even a grandmother. You know, they're just thinking in terms of that licentiousness or the pleasures that is all that they seem to have left in a world that has nothing else of meaning. But what happens when they go into that little village? <laughs> it's a kind of Eden yes. where innocence seemed once more to be possible. Yeah, there's and a party, see, there's music, there's dancing, yeah. there is but wine, but you notice there's and not, there is peace. They are gentle there. There's not even a hint of them going after them in a sexual way. They're yeah. not crude. Bishop, remember, he's talking to the chief, the old chief there. They're both observing and they're looking at these men with these young women. Before they arrived in the village, were acting like a bunch of barbarians. Here they seem to be reborn. They're laughing, playing games with the young women. They're without any apparent lust, vulgarity. Seems to be a state of pure innocence. Yeah. And when Pike couldn't believe his eyes, the elder says, we all wish to be a child again. Even the worst of us, perhaps, most of all the worst of us. And in a certain way, when they go out of that village, you know, the music, it's just an absolute Garden of Eden almost. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's a lush place. And what was a desert? So I think that was Peckinpah's attempt to recreate a ground that establishes a natural understanding of goodness, of innocence, really. But then very quickly, you're thrust back out into the world. Yep. The movie and is in two halves, and this yeah. evening sequence is the end of the first half, and is more or less in the middle of the picture, and is the only show we have of happiness. Yeah. And the movie is all of it literally about running away from the city and from society, and there's a question about what could you find except desert, hardship, savagery? In the hardship and savagery, there is also this oasis. There is a natural goodness. It is possible, if you run out of the city, to encounter grace. That's a part of Peking Paul's unique insight. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it turns out to be very temporary, but it has a certain role to play in the way Peking Paul thinks about time and history. The details of the plot, such as Pershing massing troops on the Mexican border, mm. the Great War is already going on, and they're going to use 
airplanes in it and the Germans have sent people to Mexico to try and stir trouble against the United States. All of these things point to the early years of the Great War and this is also the age where America has become civilized. Even Arizona is a state in 1912. The border is closing. America has been civilized. There is no room in America for wild men like the Wild Bunch. And at the same time, the railroads are taking control of the law in some way. The enemy, the evil people in this story are some of them Mexican warlords, the other ones American oligarchs, men who run railroads. And in America these people seem to be in charge. They are their own law enforcement and they hunt down the last wild men. Now in Mexico things are different. There is natural grace and there is also a horrifying barbarism and this is in a sense America's past. The few surviving old men of the Wild Bunch, they joined the Mexican Revolution. Maybe they can found something good for Mexico even if it's no longer possible in America. And this parallel between the histories of Mexico and America in the story that orients the plot, the first half ends with paradise, the second half ends with hell. But after that, you get this shot of Mexican soldiers, would-be liberators of Mexico actually. They are not soldiers or part of any organization. The places of help and grace are a mountain where Indians have been fighting for a thousand years. There is this yeah. village of Mexicans. These are the rare hidden places, but they are, in the second half of the movie, the winners. They are the ones who create a new kind of war because they want liberty for Mexico. And, uh, and they are the tough peasant -like yes, like soldiers fighting for their own. But and you there already you see a pre-political ground of justice. These yeah. men are motivated to establish justice for Mexico yeah. as such, not just for themselves because they have been provoked. And there is a preference there in Peking Pao for rustic simplicity over corrupt yeah. sophistication. He yeah, doesn't no like doubt. the rot. And but you have you... at least this hope that it's possible to found again on rustic yeah. simplicity the virtues but... that he himself admired in the great cowboys. Mm -hmm. But what you see already in the village that doesn't reveal itself yet there's a serpent in the garden, and that's Therese, Angel's girlfriend. I mean, the one that he, given the rules of the order of that polity or pre-polity, uh, that natural order, where he refrains from her. She's a forbidden fruit to him. But in the end, Mapachi is the one who takes that fruit. And then you see the whole temptations both for the young woman and her mother for the things that can be given and gotten in the city. It's her mother that tells my Pachi about angels having taken a, a bunch of guns. Already, again, like in Ford, there's always a, an important woman character in Peck and Paw's films. Not in the same way as Ford, because I think Peck and Paw had a strained relationship with his mother. But he, you know, he was a lot like her. And the one thing that she did that I think that antagonized him and made him really bitter toward her was she sold the ranch that his grandfather had promised to the boys, he and his brother, Denny, uh, who was by then a federal judge in California. But again, you can see Peckinpah's like Fort. It's not simply a problem of reestablishing innocence. There's problems of human nature that reveal themselves in every form. And so there's always an ambiguity. Yeah. That shows the complexity of human beings and human associations and, and even families and love and all of those things that some people in some times like to treat simply just in a one-dimensional way. But that's never the case, I think, for Ford or for Peckinpah. Yeah. So, yeah, the second half of the film, of course, is what Peckinpah perceives as how it is possible to establish oneself in the face of a corrupt society. It's not possible to go back to that innocence. You can admire the virtues and you can admire the simplicity. And you can admire the way in which these people have learned just simply to survive in the face of great adversity. But to live in a world that has been transformed by progress, not just culture change, but also the way science and technology is changing. He's wondering whether or not you can even live nobly in such a society. Yeah, And I think by the end... A... 
operates a great distinction between living by honor and living by yeah. commerce. These are themes in Shakespeare. His history of England is the transformation of honor politics into commercial politics. And this is, of course, the great theme of Don Quixote, Cervantes. But at that point, commerce was seen as preferable to yeah. honor. And this was ultimately crystallized in the political philosophy of Montesquieu. And one decade later, along comes Rousseau, who agrees with the psychology of Montesquieu in its entirety, but reverses the judgment and says, no, commerce is going to corrupt us all and you will soon regret it. This was, of course, a very big blow to enlightenment, and we can see it play out all over again in yeah. uh, Peck and Paul's The Wild Bunch, just like in Cable Hogue later, just like in Ride the High Country before that. Commerce mm. is a source of corruption of manners and mores. It introduces deceptions and all sorts of powers, and above all, it corrupts the human heart by the sin of pride. The two former friends, now enemies, William Holden and Robert Ryan, both make this point. Robert Ryan was lawless, he was a gangster, we would say nowadays, and he was caught by bounty hunters and sent to jail, to Yuma, and he was lashed and tortured until he broke and agreed to serve. That's how society breaks a noble man. And when once he gave his word, he thought that's what nobility means in a society. It's not that you're free, it's that you're free to fulfill your word, however that turned out. He's trying his hardest to do what his masters want, and his masters treat him like a slave and humiliate him and don't give him what he needs to get the job done for them. And in a moment of outrage, he says, what does it feel like to be so right? He's angry at his boss and he says, what does it feel like to have your killing hired? He says, in good. <laughs> yeah, the guy is, likes being a tyrant because yeah. he can use the power yeah. of American society without having to pay any price himself. Yeah. And you can see in what sense being a criminal is nobler than being an oligarch. The criminals are manly men and they have to take their risks and they could be heroes. The oligarchs take no risks of their own. It's only other people who might suffer for their decisions. And instead they have this great pride that they can take things over and have things their way. And William yeah. Holden echoes in another part of the movie the same worry that these people can never live with being wrong, that is to say being proven to be wrong, that is to say with losing. We see that the men of the Wild Bunch themselves, after an incredibly bloody bank robbery, some of them don't make it, and then they're on the run from a posse. They learned that what's worse, they had been set up. There was no gold, it just washers. And they live with it. No, because right. Sometimes they learn. you just have to live with it. What are you going to do? There's nothing you can do about this, just live with it. But not the civilized people, not the men who have power and install order. Pike Bishop yeah. William Holden is afraid that they can never learn that they're wrong, they can never live with getting something wrong, because above all they want to have it their own way, because they never confront the questions of mortality. This is yeah. what the Wild Bunch is confronting. These are all old men, except Anhel himself, who's middle-aged, and they have to deal with this. What are you going to do with the rest of your life? How are you going to die, specifically? Well, when you think of how the movie shows the way they have to live, Holden says to Borgnine, he says, I want to make one last score and back off. And Borgnine says, back off to what? And that's what the last half of the movie reveals. You know, what are they going to back off to? Now, they do have a score, right? They're given all mm -hmm. that money. They could have just left. But what do they do? The only thing that they can do, as one of them said, I think it was Robert Ryan, you have money, what do you do? You, you go from place to place, you try to stay out of jail. You go to have pleasure with women. And in the end, that famous scene, I think that great scene with William Holden with the whore, and mm -hmm. he's got a bottle of whiskey just as he's about to leave, and realizes it's just like he has contemplated in his mind, I got that score now, and what's left? I got money. But it's going to just be more of this. It's going to be more of the same. And so when he gets up and goes out and Dutch is out there whittling, basically they all feel the same thing. All he has to do is say, let's go. But what they realized, of course, is what it is that they're willing to go and fight for 
they realized that Angel had played out his string to the end. He was loyal to them. He was really a part of the gang. And in that long ordeal, he had shown his loyalty and his sense of honor. He didn't implicate the gang in the theft of the rifles. I think Dutch said he played his string right out to the end. When they came to the question of who do you give your word to, they came to realize that you can give your word only to those who know the importance of keeping their word. Yeah. Angel did. And in yes. the final scenes, of course, Peckinpah seems to have come to the conclusion that there's very little likelihood of living nobly in this kind of increased mechanized society without a moral foundation. But there yeah. still is the possibility of dying nobly, and that's what happens. Exactly. That's the only thing that's left. And the wild bunch are, of course, doomed from the start. They're set up. And even though they make it, we see them from the point of view of the city. They're monsters. The wild bunch yeah. is savagery. They slaughter people in the streets. They use human shields. They really are that wicked. But then we see them lose one of their own. He asks William Holden to shoot him so that he won't agonize as he's dying. Then William Holden does, but then they have to debate, are they going to bury him? And they're not. William Holden and Ernest Borgnine, the leaders, decided they don't want to. They want to run away. And the others who would want to bury him are mocked and shouted down. And there you see they have abandoned everything sacred. It's not just that they don't live in the city, they don't even bury their dead. They're doomed. And the rest of the story plays out that doom. And they see something in the figure of Angel, who is the only one who's young, or at any rate, much younger than them. He's loyal to them, as you said, he never implicates them or betrays them. But at the same time, he is loyal to his people. And they end up seeing that, yeah, they could do that as well, that because of him, because of his sacrifice, yeah. they could also do likewise. His double loyalty, both to his people and to the wild bunch, makes it possible for them as well to die nobly. That's how they get there. Because the problem that is set up with the three important men, members of the wild bunch, is insoluble in the terms in which it is stated. William Holden tries to defend his old friend by saying, well, he gave his word. But clearly he has given his word to men whom he knows are wicked. And when the wickedness becomes manifest because those railroad people are willing to shoot innocents in the streets just as much as the wild bunch are, he doesn't run away, he doesn't go off. He wants to understand his integrity in a way that ultimately collapses. And that's the problem with the Robert Ryan character, who is the one who is redeemed at the end, along with Edmund O'Brien, by the peasant Indian Mexicans. Yeah. Now, well, on the other it's... side, you have Ernest Bornine, who is the man who says, your integrity cannot be personal because you're just alone. And how do you know you're not crazy if you disagree with the world and with society? What matters is who you give your word to. That is, the character of friendship is the character of integrity. Your integrity is nothing but your loyalty to your friends. And this, of course, is how the Wild Bunch operates. They have to be true to each other despite their disagreements and their differences of character. Most of them are not patriots like Angel is a patriot. They're separated also on what they like in this life. William Holden makes a point that he has lost more than everybody else because when they were busy whoring and getting drunk, he put his money into preparing the next job, the one that fails. He is a man of a higher nature. He is given to drinking and whoring, but he also has a yearning for nobility. And so does his right-hand man, Ernest Bornine, which is why they don't need to talk about what they're doing at the end. In fact, it turns out Bornine was just waiting for him to come to oh, his yeah. senses so that they get it done. He's just whittling away mm -hmm. in the meantime. They are of a higher nature. The other ones give themselves to the desires of the body. This is the argument we know from Calicles in the Gorgias of Plato. How do you know you're free? If you obey the laws, you're just a slave to the city. But if you don't obey the laws, if you want to be the wild bunch, how do you know you're free? Well, the only way you can know you're free is if you drink, drug, whore yourself to death. Because then you know you did everything you could. You were never held back by the voice of morality or law. Neither God nor man told you to stop. So that means that you weren't a coward. You did the utmost and you committed suicide by pleasure, basically, is his argument. And clearly yeah. this is the truth about the more vulgar members of the Wild Bunch, played by Ben Johnson and Warren Oates. 
the noble well, yeah. leaders, they're looking for something else. They're looking for nobility. They're looking for a way to be true to themselves so that they can know that they really are who they think they are. And yeah, it's hard that to turns know. out to mean that you can only do it by choosing a noble death. And that's yeah. one of I the think great that's... things that Pekinpa shows by focusing a Western on tragedy. It shows you that whether you go the vulgar way or the noble way, you can't be true to yourself unless you choose your death. You have to well, face up to your mortality. The importance of the scene in the village for those you're talking about as the vulgar that gives them a feeling, let's say, mm -hmm. of a kind of existence that they could never have known. So does that prepare the way for them in the end to know what let's go means? Because, yeah. they, you know, you can say about Borgnein, he understands that he's the most philosophical of all of them. Yeah. And about the Pike Bishop character, you can say there is a certain natural leader nobility in him and everyone yeah. recognizes that. But that transformative interlude in the Garden of Eden gave them a sense of both what the sweetness of life was, but also the impending doom that is made more clear to them the things that they know that they're going to live by in the rest of their lives about whoring and all of that, which in a real way is nothing. I really think that Peckinpah does understand this whole dilemma in Rousseau's way. And you can see that in the way in which mm -hmm. he thought that the progress of science and technology had not made men happier or made them greater. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it only served to weaken human character. He said once in one of his interviews, he said, I detest machines. The problem started when they discovered the wheel. <laughs> He's going yep. way back. And yet, when somebody pointed out to him, you know, the camera is a machine, he denied that. He said, you're not going to tell me the camera is a machine. It is the most marvelous piece of divinity ever created. That's how he viewed the camp. So the possibilities of the camera, the divinity of the camera is established by its universality. The way in which it can reveal, create, it, it can destroy. Age, yeah. Poetry and the means of making poetry is the last way for human beings to know themselves. It does have the power to create and destroy. Both myth and illusion has the capacity to represent truth, but also to undermine it, to show reality, but to misrepresent reality as well. And it can ennoble or degrade those who yeah. come under its spell. Peckinpah never wanted to use the camera as a way of degrading. I mean, he always wanted it to be understood in the service of something higher, whether yeah. it's nobility or honor or whatever. And so uh, I think his attitude toward technology and to the camera gives you some sense of what his view of the possibilities of nobility of life in a pre-political state, in that state of nature that he mm -hmm. tries to portray. There was an epigraph that one of the writers on Peckinpah, a guy named Paul Sedor's book, I'd, I'd read this some years ago, and he used an epigraph from Perry Miller, who wrote about the American artist. He was applying it to Rousseau, but I think it could be applied to Peckinpah as well, and this is what it is. The American artist cherishes in his innermost being the impulse to reject completely the gospel of civilization in order to guard with resolution the savagery of his heart. And in some ways, <laughs> that is Peckinpah's dilemma, too. He made his accommodations with civilization, but he never liked it. Yes, and this gave him his unique insight, his unusual standpoint to American society, and his unusual view, therefore, of the times. With yeah. The collapse of confidence in the American way, all these new insights become available. But on the other hand, you also see in this way that all things are abandoned, a gospel of progress is adopted instead. And what comes out of that transformation is for some people unbearable. Yeah. Well, you notice though, as I said at the beginning, Peckinpah is at heart a Rousseauian, but he gives a fair hearing to Locke in the Ballad of Cable Hope. Yeah, and I mean, of course, you, after Ride the High Country, we should talk about that as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in that movie, I think you see exactly what progress, wealth, property mean to human life. Now, it doesn't come out well for Cable Hope, but you mm -hmm. notice it's a very good way of formulating 
the problem of progress and wealth. It's a bittersweet phenomenon, really. That, yes. that. And so it was Cable Hogue who finds water out there in the desert and, and is able to turn that into a profitable enterprise. It's ironic, you know, in the end that water gives way to gasoline and that's what kills <laughs> the automobile. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, that's Progress. another that's another yeah. story. But it's again part of Peck and Paw's ambivalence to the machine and to technology. But it's interesting that somehow the motion picture, the camera, he refused to review that as anything technical. It was a kind of divinity. One imagines that no great artist or no great poet would think differently. <laughs> No, that's probably true. And I think it does show you, though, how much difference it makes in terms of what the outcome is. In whose hands does that camera fall? Because yes. in the hands of a Ford or a Peckinpah, you get something. But in the hands of others, you get some things that are far different. Regrettable. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Well, sir, I think we can close on this note and in our next conversation deal with Ride the High Country. Yeah, that's that's a good one. I think we can see some of the early Peck and Paws views of uh, the problem of the virtues and the law. Yes. Thank you again for joining me, sir. All okay. the best. All right. We'll see you.